All right, Illinois basketball picks up another top 10 win. This one in the Ken Palm at the rankings at the time as they take down number two, Texas, 85-78 at Madison Square Garden. Phenomenal atmosphere and a phenomenal comeback that Illinois is actually able to close out. And Michael Tuop, we've seen Illinois kind of overcome these, these lulls that they have in games and, and make it a game, but they came back and won this one. How? Why were they able to do this? What's your biggest takeaway from a, a comeback overtime win? Yeah, I think, again, just the resolve. We've talked about it time and time again with this team. Um, they have a knack for a lot of their guys being very even keel, and I think that that helps you in these moments where you, you feel like a lot of those 50-50 calls aren't aren't going your way, and backbreaker after backbreaker, uh, you feel like you're climbing into it. And, you know, Brock Cunningham hits a three. You feel like you're climbing into it. Coleman takes the ill-advised shot that leads to the Dylan Mitchell run out for the lob and um but they kept fighting and look this is it's funny when you when you think about basketball because a lot of people that watch the game it's one of two things right you know it's oh my god these offensive lulls right but what you don't realize is that every college basketball team has these every game the difference is your defense because think about that eight to 10 point lead that Texas had. If that thing ballooned to 20, you wouldn't be talking about their offense. You just wouldn't be. And, and I think I, you got to have some perspective here where you start to get in this rhythm as a viewer and you look and you're like, oh my God, we didn't score again, but we got another stop. Oh, we didn't score again, but we got another stop. Like those stops are important. Those stops are what even keeps you in the game. Because the other thing that I'll mention too, because I I went back and I'm like I gotta look I gotta look at this. So Illinois had a five minute stretch, five five and a half minute stretch without scoring. Texas had from the eleven thirty three mark to the six thirty three mark two points, from the one one fifty four in regulation to two fifty one in overtime two points. So if you're a Texas fan, you're sitting there too, and that's you know those are two these are two top ten teams in the country but go look any any other game in college basketball it happens all the time the difference is your defense being able to to kind of keep them at bay and give yourself a chance to get back in it yeah it almost gets overlooked mike because texas had 78 points in an overtime game you held them under a point per possession yeah a team that, that is capable i know they're not a great shooting team but a team that is capable of doing that and you're right during that stretch like those two sincere harris blocks like they were just massive because it kept it from getting out of hand and kept you within reach. And then Melendez hits a three, Meyer hits a three, and all of a sudden you're in this thing. Um, this is this defense is kind of what Brad Underwood said it would be. It's it's got the potential to be one of the best in the country right now. Yeah. Um, looking at Kempom, it is number 12 in defensive efficiency. And the biggest difference, Mike, 12 blocks in this game, too shy of a, a program record. Right now, they're 12th in the country in block rate. And just to put that in perspective, the first five years of Brad Underwood, 310th, 268th, 257th, 263rd, 262nd. And it's not just one guy like Coleman Hawkins. It's RJ Melendez. It's Sincere Harris. It's Dane, Dane Danger. It's, it's Matthew Meyer with three. This team is long. It's athletic. And it's recovery at the rim. Uh, like, what does that allow for a team? Well, I think first and foremost, it's, you know, you, you look at the the five out nature of it in the switch one through five. Um, essentially, I think you're, you're seeing a lot of teams think that they can exploit matchups that, that really aren't there. And it's trying to take Coleman Hawkins off the dribble. He's sending a few back. People try to take Matthew Meyer off the dribble. I thought Meyer's weak side help and verticality was was incredible. And um, look, I think ultimately this team their the the length the athleticism i mean rj's block at the end when it, i think it was 81 76 and and he blocked a shot to prevent prevent it from being a one possession game um the double jump right like there it's it, it's it's different when especially and dane too with his length i think dane is so good in drop coverage for where he's at in his career and he's only going to get better and it, I, I thought it forced Tyrese Hunter into some uncomfortable shots in, in that drop. And they, they get it from everybody. Like you've seen sky blocks of shots. And I, I think Jaden actually almost got a piece of Marcus Carr's at the end of regulation. So, 
know, this is going to continue to be the story and they're doing it for the most part w- without filing. And they're doing it for the most part when you have guys that can block shots on the ball. Cause that wasn't the case with, it just wasn't the case with Trent. It wasn't the case with fellow and, and some of these shorter lineups, but having guys that can block shots on the ball is huge because even if they don't get it, they alter it. And then you're not taking yourselves out of position for, for rebounds. So that that's been a, a huge key too. And it's, you know, sincere especially, I mean, you block that shot off the backboard, you basically ignite the fast break and get it cut to five. I thought his minutes were were tremendous. It's fascinating to see, like, you know, Illinois under Kofi. What Kofi changed is their two-point defense. Uh, went from bad, right, when you were pressuring out because you had to. You're one of the worst in the country at two-point defense, and you were 47th, 20th, 20th. Without Kofi, you've kept it, right? Like, okay. you're 14th in the country in two-point defense. It's just fascinating how you can do it in so many different ways. Well, the other thing, too, is a lot of times, especially when you look at Kempom, a lot of that stuff can be super skewed depending on schedule and yeah. who you've played and per- when you start looking at percentages and where that ranks nationally. I thought that – honestly, I thought that was the case with Texas. That's why I really liked Illinois going into that game because I'm looking at them like, man, this is – they got rebounded by UTEP, right? They got out-rebounded by Northern Arizona. Creighton out-rebounded them. Uh, Gonzaga out-rebounded them. Like, Illinois should out-rebound them tonight. And if they don't let them get loose from three, because all those teams, like, you're not going to shoot 28% for the season. But a lot of times when you look at these analytics, like right now, Illinois has enough quality opponents between, I know Syracuse isn't great, but they're a high major team. between You know, Syracuse, UCLA, Virginia, Maryland. Um, yeah, they got four quad one games, right? Yeah, and then Texas. So, you know, you got a pretty good body of work there. And... I think we'll get into the the late game execution stuff, but I think, you know, all that, a lot of this stuff was going to be trial and error and just figuring it out. And the fact that they've been able to do that and maintain a seven and two record is, is pretty insane considering the opponents they've had. Yeah. Just to go big, Mike, I mean, haven't they proved the first month of the season, they can beat anyone anywhere. Like on a given night, they have a chance to beat anyone anywhere. I mean, there's still better teams, right? Like Houston, is is great um but texas is a really good team are they great are they a final four i think they have capability of doing that i think ucla has that virginia has that um this has been pretty impressive like are they further along than you thought or is this what you thought they could be in the first month this illinois team they're they're in the game they're in the game they can play with anybody and, and part of that is is their floor part of that is their ceiling, obviously, but these teams, you're, you're not always guaranteed to get there. You're not always guaranteed to hit that. You still have to, like, it doesn't just happen. It's, you know, when you get through these peaks and valleys of the season, the teams that can stay even keel like this team does, and we've seen it, are the teams that can give themselves the best chance to uh, to, to win in March. And it, it is all about matchups. And this, this Illinois team presents really tough matchups for teams. That you got to play a different style. And the fact that they can play multiple styles with, if you want to throw in Dane at the five, if you want to go a little bit bigger, uh, you know, you, you can do that. And look, I, I said this on post-game radio. When, when you're in the early stage of a rebuild, okay, it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating. There's a lot of losses. There's, you know, it, it can be tough as a fan. And I think what you start to realize as a fan is at times it can be more frustrating when you're really good. <laughs> like it, it can be more frustrating. And I see it, like I see it all the time, you know, on online and this and that, but look, this is, you know, this is what this is, man. This is a really good team. This has turned into an incredible program uh, over, over the past couple of years. And, and, and I think you just got to continue to, to understand that there's so much more that they can get better at. There's so much more. And what you don't want is to still be having that conversation in like late March or, or, or late April or late February, early March, where you're just like, yeah, but if we just, you know, could clean up the, yeah. they got it. Like their, their foundation right now, they're way ahead of where I thought they would be, but their foundation is, is pretty incredible. Cause there's just been the emergence of a lot of guys in, in different situations that, you know, maybe you didn't anticipate going into the year. Let's bring this up. I think we thought this guy would uh, step up at certain points of the year. But Matthew Meyer, I had a feeling, Madison Square Garden, Matthew Meyer's played in big games. Some of these other guys have not. And right from the start, Mike scores the first five points of the game. You're thinking, okay, 
Uh, they might get a Matthew Meyer performance and they needed every bit of those oh, points yeah. in, in the first half because everyone else basically w- was struggling outside of maybe Coleman Hawkins uh, in that first half. So I'm not expecting, no one should expect 21 points and seven straight made shots from Matthew Meyer. What does this game do for him and what's sustainable for him consistently? Yeah. Look, water was always going to find its level with Matt. That's just basketball. And, and he's too good of a player with these early season struggles and trying to get acclimated, like this was, it was going to pop and you could tell him getting more comfortable and him being a little bit more settled within the offense, committing himself to the defensive end. I thought we talked about on the last podcast, like you commit yourself to the defense and rebounding the offense just kind of figured figure itself out. And look, it's all, it's not always the best quality um, that you'd like, but I, I'll take a guy that has a, an immense amount of confidence in himself to take those types of shots because they're, they are, they're back breaking to the other team. And uh, you could tell you're watching that Texas bench. They, they had seen that movie before. And a few times Chris Beard was like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, but look, he, I, I talked about the belief he has in himself and uh, beyond just the ability to score. He took some guys off the dribble. He did it really in all three phases. Uh, he had a shot at the rim. He had a shot, you know, to the turnaround fadeaway in the mid range and then obviously hitting the five threes he, he's an integral part to this team and it goes beyond just the the flurries that he can have like this be, be having a guy like that six nine that can basically be your versatile four man and and be somewhat like Matthew Meyer is kind of a rim protector mm-hmm. like he is I mean he has three blocks and altered a few more and he has great timing and great athleticism and he's been so good on the glass. Um, and it's not always just him going in and snaring the rebound. It's staying locked in and making sure you hit your guy to make sure someone else can come in. I've just been, I've been really impressed with him and, and look, it's important the way he's handled these first few games, you have guys that can check out. Uh, and, and when it's your older guys, when it's your leaders, that's, you can't have that because that's going to trickle down. That's going to permeate to more of the younger guys. I, th- I truly think a lot of these younger guys, although they come in with, a pedigree and and you know they're they're even keel i think they still are following the lead of some of these older guys and i think they're setting the example whether that's coleman or or matt or terrence or rj uh and they're doing a great job of it so you know i think matt in general if he starts hitting his stride it's not gonna be 21 every night it's not gonna be five for five from three but teams are guarding him like that and that's just as important on the offensive end Terrence Shannon had an awful first 40 minutes offensively, uh, defensively, and, and uh, he did some really good things. Uh, Jade Neps had one point in the first 35 minutes of this game. What did you see from them late game? To be able to turn that on, Mike, can't be easy uh, as a player. Yeah, look, it, it encapsulates the makeup of this team. It's, hey, Matthew Myers is going to hold the fourth down here for a second. Okay. And then we'll give, we'll, we'll open that up for sincere to come in and make an impact. Right. And then we'll have Coleman will, will do his thing. And then, Hey, knockout punch. Here's Terrence and Jaden. And that it, it's hard, man. Like it's, it's hard, especially for, for freshmen to, to come in and not starting obviously, but I think his mentality and probably his personality, uh, he just always seems even, even watching post-game interviews and he's just always even keel. He's always, uh, he's, he's not obviously not afraid of the moment. Uh, so to have a guy like that come in that you can put in, in late games and say, Hey, all right, we got something here. It's, you know, some of the shots like the one at Maryland, I don't know. He makes it, he's the hero. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's hard to be like, Oh yeah, you missed it. But I mean, he had a pull up, he had a pull up jumper, um, in the in, at the end of I think it was six sixty six sixty one, maybe, and he had like a pull up that was kind of eh, questionable. But the fact that he's willing to take those, um, and, and this game should only give him confidence. And Terrence, you, you can continue to just be so impressed with him. Uh, that was a mature game. That was a really mature game from him because I, I think ultimately with him you're always going to need his defense and his rebounding. That goes for everybody, man. Like everybody. And even more so on this team, because you're not going to score every single game. Uh, Terrence is going to get, Terrence is going to get probably double digits most games, 
but it's going to fluctuate for a lot of these guys. So the defense and rebounding has to become, uh, has to be what's uniform. And the last point that I'll make is a lot of teams, when you're a leading scorer, when you're 19, 20 point per game guy, is scoreless at half. And well, I, did he have two points going into overtime? He had four because of the goaltend. He made That's a, right. That's he made right. a pity, and then he, uh, which was a confident one to start the half. It was great. Yeah. Sign, and then, he still got out of control a little bit. Um, teams collapsing on him, obviously, but yeah, four points heading into he had one go through the hoop. <laughs> yeah, no, it, sp- it speaks to the talent of his team. And if you look across the Big Ten, Zach Eady goes scoreless in a half. That's probably not good for Purdue. Right. That's it's just not. And and you could say that for a lot of teams. And I think that's that's what you realize about this Illinois team is, man, it could be Sky next game, right? You just you just never know. And I think that one through eight, one through nine. And then you were going to bring Luke Goody back into this. So it's, it's going to continue to get fascinating, but those two guys in particular, Terrence and Jaden, it's, you know, kudos to the guys early in the game, in the middle of the game, but those guys really came and delivered the knockout. Mike, I got to get this stat for you about RJ Melendez, but following up on Jaden Epps, who kudos to him. There was been some, you know, Virginia, Maryland, some late game performances that, he didn't make shots, right? He had the ball in his hands. But kudos to Brad Underwood to going back to him because it pays off right here. And I think that shows why he's doing the things he's doing of having Jaden Epps in, in late game over Sky Clark. I don't want to make this a conflict thing like Jaden versus Sky that, that some people are like, hey, why isn't Jaden starting? Well, Sky's doing a pretty good job to start games and Jaden's doing a pretty good job to end games. And both those guys are playing top five minutes on the team. So they're basically playing starters minutes. But um what do, you, what do you make of, of these two and how Brad Underwood is kind of playing them together at times, playing them differently at times? Um, it's great to have two top 50 freshman guards, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think it's a great marriage um, with them. I, I think, look, what Sky offers to start the game is he gets, guy, he gets guys involved. And it's important to have a point guard that can set the table and get guys in rhythm to start the game. I'm not saying Jaden doesn't do that, but but Jaden's much more scoring minded, probably much more assertive uh, on the offensive end when when you when you look at that, and and that really lends itself to late game. It really does, and and I think that's the balance of it. We we talk about it all the time. It's not always as simple as this guy's, you know, producing more than this guy. Start him. It's actually you know having balance in your rotations is is just as important when you have. You can have a Jaden Epps that you can bring off your bench that may be a little more scoring minded. That's good. Like along that's, with that's, Dane, right? Like I think Underwood Dane. loves that group. Like you bring sincere and Ty for defense. You bring Dane and Jaden for offense. Yeah, and look with with Jaden too. I, I think Sky Jane's been been tremendous. I, I, I think defensively, uh, he there's some communication stuff that I think he and a few of the freshmen are going to continue to get better at. But look for him you bring him in with Dane because I think it, it suits both of them better to to play and drop and have Jaden fight over and square it back up and keep his match up. Uh, Sky obviously can, can hold his own maybe a little bit better in, in one through five when he switches onto these bigs and um, he's probably a better rebounder as well. So look, I think it's, it's fun to kind of be able to mix and match a little bit here. And I, I think the other thing too is, you know, Sky, even from a distance, he, he's been a pro about this. Right, you could be the guy. It's like, oh man, I'm starting. I should be finishing this out, and you see him cheering just as much as everybody else. And uh, look, Jaden, and you said credit Brad Underwood. You're exactly right. I think you see the Virginia game, and I thought he broke a th- few things off. And Maryland, he takes the late shot, which, like I said, he makes it. You you may be one and zero in the Big Ten, but for him to go back to him, like there's there's obviously something there, and he's continuing to show it because the. The three hit in the corner, the two free throws he steps up. I mean, I, it's funny. I think maybe maybe Meyer had the quote where he's like, there's no one else I'd rather have shooting these free throws right now. I mean, to say that nine games into someone's freshman year is is insane. And Matt has not held back. Like, he goes, I thought we'd be good. I didn't think we'd be this good because the freshmen are better than I thought. Um, and I think they have been. Like, like, I know we had high expectations for Sky Clark and Ty Rogers, and maybe I haven't quite hit that, but like, Sky's got poise, man. I know he's not always going to score as much as some people want, but you're mentioning it. The defense, the rebounding has been better than I thought. Um, he needs to clean up some turnovers, but that's expected. Jaden's 
translating uh, his scoring at the you know high school level to this level has been phenomenal. And then I'll, I'll give you a minute. Sincere Harris, man. Like I, I, I didn't know what his role would be. I thought Ty Rogers would kind of play that role more, but he's making game changing defensive plays game after game in the biggest games of the season. Sincere Harris may not score 600 points in his Illinois career. <clears throat> and it won't matter because his impact is that immense uh, on the defensive end. It, it's it, this is this, not the first time you mentioned it. This is not the first time he's come in and just and just made his presence felt. And it's funny, not only just the his activity and uh, his ball pressure. I don't think I've ever seen a guy be able to reach and try to make a steal and somehow st- still keep the guy in front. Yeah. And I, I think he's, I, he's a really good athlete. I think he's an even better athlete than people think. Um, that block that he, the block that he had off the backboard was insanity. And then the, even the block that he had um, that was head up rotating over from the weak side, it hit the body control there to not get a foul. And he actually went to, uh, he actually went to block it with his I'm trying to think either his right hand or left hand I remember watching the film and I'm like man if he goes with that other hand he fouls him and he, yeah. he almost like came across and blocked it I think I think with his right hand if he goes left he probably hits him with his body and fouls him so like in the moment he just has such good instincts on that end and you can tell whether it's Marcus Carr Tyrese I mean these are really good college basketball players and they did not look comfortable at all and, and even when he gets switched here's the thing man like they're going to switch one through five if he's in the game, depending on depending on if you know if Dane's in there, they're not. But he makes bigs uncomfortable. He fights them in the post. He rebounds like man. And and the other thing too is he knows who he is offensively, which is which is equally as important. Where you're like, hey, he's great defensively, but like, ah, oh, he's just trying to do too much. Like he knows exactly who he is. He you know that I think it was the Terrence and one that he does that. He hits the quick rotation. Like he got the drift pass. Didn't even think twice. Boom, Terrence. Terrence puts it on the ground and won in overtime. That really kind of sealed the deal. All right. These are the stats I want to bring up. RJ Melendez, last three games. First halves, Mike. Five points, two for nine shooting, three rebounds. Second halves, 30 points, nine for 11 shooting, 13 rebounds. Why is RJ Melendez a second half player right now? Toughness, man. Like that is, that's, that's a lot of toughness there. And I'm not, I'm not sure you could have said that early on for him as a freshman. Again, obviously he wasn't getting the playing time, but I think there is, we always talk about the psychology of knowing that, you know, you, you'll probably be in the game. You know, if you're the guy that doesn't get off, doesn't have a good first half and you know, you're probably not going to play much in the second half, you probably press even more when you're in there. And I think he just, he just looks so comfortable. And I think he's been such, he's benefited so much from the people around him as well. You know, Terrence, I think has taken a lot of pressure off RJ. Matt's taken a lot of pressure off RJ and he can, he can really get out on the break. We've seen that from him, you know, the, the catch and shoot stuff. I thought, I thought, you know, they, they drew up, they ran a great play to, to create some confusion there on the three to make it 58, 56. He's just, he, he's been kind of Johnny on the spot in these, in these late games uh, and really not even really the late games, but like the he's been kind of a killer in like the 12 to six minute mark, uh, which is which is what you needed in, in a, you know, in a stretch where things were kind of brutal offensively. So credit him, man. And and I think, too, he's he's really accepted the challenge defensively and, and on the glass, because I think that's he knows that that's what's going to end it like ultimately keep him on the floor. I love the setup this year for him. I I, I just think. This allows a natural progression yeah. for him. Like we were talking about him in the spring. He might have to be one of the top two scorers on this team. And then of course they they crushed it in the portal. But to have Meyer and Shannon here and even a guy like Jaden Epps, like I think I think it just alleviates some pressure and allows him to be that complimentary piece, but he's one of the yeah. best complimentary pieces in the Big Ten. And then I can see him like next year being a star. Like if he had to be a star now, I think he'd be struggling with that a little yeah. bit, creating his own shot and things like that. I think this sets up for him naturally uh to, to become a star by the time he's he's a junior, but he's he's coming up a huge in some of these moments. Well well, it's the attention, right? And yeah, there's a lot of attention on those other guys, like I mentioned. 
and I think it does allow you to develop. It allows you to kind of gain some confidence without feeling like the whole thing is on your shoulders. Correct. Yeah. And look, I think if he was the a top two guy on this team in terms of options, it's not saying that like he couldn't do it, but it would be much, much more difficult because odds are if he's top two, then, you know, what are your other pieces look like? Do they have to give a lot of attention to those? And now he's the one that's commanding all that. And I'm not, I'm not sure that he was particularly ready for that. Right. And I, I, I think the world of him as a player, but I'm not sure from getting somewhat limited minutes freshman year to just being thrusted in that that's hard for anybody. That's hard for anybody, especially, especially when you're doing wholesale changes and everybody leaves and it's a whole new um, kind of offensive scheme, defensive scheme. That's, that's tough to do, but I think he's, he's been able to, you've already seen development from just the beginning of the year. We're nine games in and he's starting to kind of hit his stride and you're starting to see him, Matthew Meyer, like everybody's starting to get this little uptick and you're seeing the level of play raise on this team because, you know, I, I talked about it with Jacob Grandison and some of these guys, like your fourth, your fourth, fifth guy, like that's where teams really make a difference mm -hmm. in, in the NCAA tournament in postseason play. If you have, everybody's got, everybody's got like a top two, top one, top two, everybody, most people have that. Now, how good your top one or top two are, that depends. But if your four and five can play like top twos on different nights and they don't have to be the top twos, that's, that's huge. And I think that raises your floor as well. I think we're 25 minutes into this, Mike, and I have you, and we haven't really mentioned Coleman Hawkins. Boy, he's good defensively. <laughs> he's good. He's yeah, it's he's nuts, man. And and honestly, they kept trying to switch. I they kept trying to to exploit that particular matchup. And he gets the steal at the end of overtime and uh you know, blocked three shots. I think he altered so many more. I mean, Bishop and, and Mitchell were just not comfortable whatsoever around the rim. Yeah. Just smoking layups that they probably wouldn't usually miss. And it, it, his impact is can we bring up crazy. the pass? The, the pass. pass the the pass like it the, is I, that's a that i don't want to i'm not speaking in hyperbole here that that pass the feel i i i personally don't think he saw him talking to coleman after the game he says i see everything <laughs> so i i trust him that he kind of, that he knew he was there but i was audibly laughing when that pass got through, because that is just such a remarkable pass in the moment to, to know and have the feel that he's there. And we'll, t we'll show it on the film and I'll be probably falling out of my chair watching it again. Cause it's just, it's, it's incredible. And I thought, I thought, I thought he got a little carried away at times with some of the shot selection. He knows that, but ultimately, man, I, you look at what he brings. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Like he is, he, he's a big part of what makes this thing go. And, and you can see that these teams kind of don't know what to do with him. They don't know what to do with him offensively, defensively. It's, it's okay. We got to switch onto the big. Is this really a advantage? Like it's, it's been crazy seeing his, his maturation. I think a lot of it's been just him having a little bit more freedom in a system that fits him a little bit more. Uh, and he's taking it and running with it, man. All right, Mike. 11 a.m. Saturday morning tip off against a Penn State team and a Penn State program under its last couple coaches. That's feisty. Yep. It's a feisty team. Uh, they, they weren't able to win their last game. But um, what do you what do you make of this matchup, especially coming off such a huge victory for this team? But Illinois is 0 and 1 in, in Big Ten play and yep. you got to protect home court uh, in the Big Ten. Yeah, it's going to be a different game. That's for sure. We know with, with Penn State and feels like no matter what coach they bring in there it's it's just a you know it's a rock fight most times you know those games always end up being in the 50s and I, i'll be really interested to see how they play this illinois team because because penn state plays a lot of uh, a lot of five out two they don't they don't have a traditional big in there a lot and you know miles dread comes off the bench they'll put miles dread at the five so it's there's it's gonna it should be a, a pretty good matchup um, now that said, I think that this Illinois team is not a good matchup for a lot of teams. Right. Uh, and the, I think the other thing too, is, I mean, Penn state, they're, they're really playing this pack line D they're, I think they're 
one of the like bottom 10 in the country in forcing turnovers. They just don't force turnovers. So I think that helps, that helps an Illinois team. They get, they get absolutely nothing back on the offensive glass. Uh, I think they're, they're 18% uh, getting it back on the glass, which is asked in the country. They're 356th. It, it's, <laughs> it's, almost... it's pretty, yeah, pretty far down there. There's a lot of metrics in here that kind of make it scratch your head a little bit, but they're tough. You know, that's what, you know, they're going to do. They're going to be tough. And uh, they're one of the best three point shooting teams in the country. And I think that's, what's kept them in a lot of these games. Uh, you know, they obviously lose to Michigan state. Uh, they lose uh, to Clemson. Uh, they, they played Vatek pretty close. Vatek's going to be a top 25 team next week. Um, but look, you just got to stick to to what you do. That's the beauty of what Illinois does. Like you have to adjust to Illinois. Illinois doesn't really have to adjust to you. Like that's, that's, that's kind of the the name of the game here. And I think the the teams that possess that, that the ability to not have to completely overhaul their game plan every single game to try to squeak out a win, uh, you can create some more uniformity. You can create some more cohesion there. But I, I'm really interested. This team absolutely chucks threes. So we know you let them make 13 or 14 threes. Like, it's a game. It's a game. And I think the switching will bother them. But understanding... This is why it becomes important, right? right? When Dane Dange is in the game, like communicating that we're not switching it when, when Dane's man sets a, a screen. So I'll, I'll be interested to see how much he plays too. Cause I think you can see it, the advantage on the offensive end. And then you saw too, like Dane struggled a little bit popping out on Brock Cunningham to contest those threes. And that's going to be miles dread uh, for Penn state. So it's a fascinating matchup. It's one that, you know, I think, I think Illinois should win. Obviously you protect home court. Uh, and you want to you want to at least split these first two Big Ten games. You don't want to fall to zero two. All right, Mike. We got about a month sample size here. Uh, who are you buying stock in the Big Ten right now? It's interesting. I mean, Illinois for sure. I mean, like at this at this point, it's I, I know we we talk about Illinois, but I don't know how you couldn't be be buying stock in Illinois. I, I, they lost a heartbreaker last night, but I do really like Rutgers. Um, I think I, I think Rutgers is great. I mean, they got absolutely screwed last night. Um, I mean, Tanner Holden's four feet out of bounds, steps in, makes the three. Uh, yeah, I, I think Rutgers is one of those one of those teams that can be around. I, I truly believe they can be a team in that top four, top five. Michigan is interesting. Um, they need to play Hunter like thirty seven minutes a game because when he's off the floor, it is ugly. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how Jet Howard continues to progress and. Llewellyn's out for the season, obviously. So what do you get from McDaniel and Buffkin and, and these other guards? But um, it, it seems like every single year you're like, oh, down year in the Big Ten. And then it's like, man, is Wisconsin just going to hang around here and be like a top four team again? And, and then the other teams that I'll mention too, Purdue, we talked about it, right? And Purdue could very well on December 22nd be the number one team in the country because Houston plays Virginia. They should not lose one of these games. Uh, for the rest of the the, the calendar year here. Um, I, I'm not there whatsoever on, on Purdue. Um, I'll buy Purdue for the regular season. I sure. I still can. Like I can buy Purdue as a top 15 team the rest of the season. I'm interested to see how they match up against Illinois, Iowa, teams that spread them out. Um, I just, I don't think Gonzaga is great. Uh, nope. Duke is, is young. It felt like they didn't know how to deal with Edie. These Big Ten teams know how to deal with Edie. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested to see them in January when they play Rutgers, Ohio State, um, you know, Michigan State. But really, I don't think we're going to learn a lot about them until no. late January, early February when they have their toughest stretch uh, of their schedule. But they're a very good team. I mean, I, I think Matt Painter likes this crew. It seems like they like playing with each other, but it is so Edie dependent that I'm interested when they play against opponents that have talent and know how to defend Edie. Yeah. The gravity of Edie alone is, is enough to, to probably get you into the top five of the conference. Uh, We'll see where they're at. You know, I'm looking at their schedule right now, just at, at first glance, you know, you, you, after playing, I mean, they open up with Minnesota and Nebraska. Um, I mean, Nebraska, I don't know. They, They beat Creighton. I don't know if that says more about Creighton or Nebraska. Um, but just off, off first glance here, it looks like they get Maryland twice. Uh, they get Wisconsin twice, uh, or I think they get Wisconsin twice. They may get Wisconsin once, but, uh, they get Illinois once. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Illinois has a very favorable 
Big Ten schedule as well. Uh, it, it's really weird. These early games, these these first two in December, there aren't a ton of great matchups. I, 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 don't, I mean, I think maybe Wisconsin plays Iowa next. But for the most part, I don't know. Like, I, I think you know, Rutgers, Ohio State, okay, maybe. But, you know, Michigan State, Northwestern, and Purdue, Nebraska, Purdue, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota, Michigan. Uh, I want to start seeing these heavy hitters face off here. Like, I want to see Indiana, Purdue. I want to see Indiana, Illinois, Purdue, Illinois, um, you know, Iowa, Illinois, these, these teams that you know, can really vie for, for a conference title. And we saw last night, ch- chalk another one up. I'm not even sure if I've mentioned the man down theory um, that, that I have. When the, when in college basketball, when the best player is out, it's the first game that they're out that the team always plays above their head and potentially wins the game. So when Chris Murray went down for Iowa last night, um, or wasn't going to play for Iowa last night. I was like, well, give me Iowa because that's that's a classic man down game. So you look across the conference, I understand that they lost a lot of talent. I understand a lot of talent got drafted, but shoot, there were a lot of returners and I thought a lot of these teams really really kind of nailed it in the portal. I mean, there's there's a lot of underrated pickups in the portal. If you want to talk about what Ohio State's done, yeah. uh, kind of piecing that thing together and then uh, you know, on, on top of that as well, Rutgers goes out and gets Cam Spencer, right? Who's 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 been tremendous for them, too. So, um, it, it should be a fascinating race, right? Yeah. And and I'll, I'll, let me let me mention this because I had this argument back in like 2015 in a hotel room with I forget who I was arguing with. Well, like, what's the best conference in college basketball? And Someone, I, the argument I was having was, you know, someone was trying to tell me that the Big 12 at that time was the best conference in college basketball. And my thought process was, a, if a team wins your conference 14 straight years, you're not the best conference in college basketball. Like, does that, I, I don't know. I, I'd, love, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Because is parity in your conference is good? A, but yeah, like, I, I get that point. Uh, I love the Big 12, the top of it, right? I, I think yeah. that league at the top is is really strong. I think it's probably got three teams you can see being in the Final Four. Yeah. Are there three teams in the Big Ten I can see being in the Final Four? I'm not sure. I, I, I think the highest ceiling teams in the Big Ten, I still think are Illinois and Iowa. I, I really do. Um, Iowa's got some some depth issues, maybe some front court um, you know, I'd, I'd maybe like their, their center to be a little bit better, even though Robracha just had his best game in an Iowa uniform. Like, Indiana's really good, though. Like, Purdue's really good. Like, there's just a lot of really good teams. Like, you look at the Ken Palm, how many top 50 teams? We got four outside of the top 50. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous depth in the Big Ten. And I do think they beat each other up. I think they just had some bad luck. <laughs> I think they've just had some bad luck, maybe not had quite the guard play. Um, to, to go to these final fours, but you know, you can, you can pick apart. Like I think the big 12, the big 10, uh, and, and the sec certainly got talent at the top, but I, I think it's a big 10, big 12. You can make arguments for either of those leagues. Yeah. And, and even, you know, for, for these big 10 teams in general, I think you're going to see, especially over the next five years, the narrative has always been, you know what, they haven't won a national championship since Michigan state, um, yeah. Uh, and then the, the tournament success just hasn't been there over the years. I think, I honest, honestly, I think the portal is going to change that over the, over the next five years. You're going to see, I think you're going to see a lot more Big Ten success because quite frankly, I don't know if it, it may just be me sitting here. Like I'm seeing players that are in the Big Ten that I would have never guessed would be in the Big Ten. And Terrence Shannon's one of them. You know, Matthew Meyer is one of them. Like you're getting these guys from, from the Big 12 and from these other conferences. Um and NIL, I think, is going to change that as well. I mean, we, we've seen that even in football yep. a little bit. Like, this this is going to shift a little bit, and I actually think it can shift in, in the Big Ten's favor. All right, Mike. Uh, great stuff as always, man. Uh, we got another couple games here, and uh, I know it slows down in December. What's December like for, for a player? Because you actually get a little practice time. Uh, I'm sure Brad Underwood loves this. Yeah, December's weird because – you know, once winter break hits, you, you're just walking, you're driving around campus. No one's there. You know, you go to practice and you're, you're basically in the NBA at that point. I mean, you're, you're in the facility coaches, or at least coach gross wanted to keep us in the facility for, for a long time. And we did two days. I'm sure they'll do some two days. 
uh, just keeping guys around each other and uh, look, the, the holiday break is always a good pivot point because you're, you're heading into big 10 play. And, uh, and then also too, you got, you're probably seeing family, right? You want to, you want to keep guys around. You don't want to let family get into or friends get into too many guys ears, or you should be doing this or man, they're screwing you or this and that. So it's, it's that it, it's a really good inflection point because it's a, it's a time where if you, if you treat the the time, you know, and value that time, uh, you can really kind of hit another gear. And, and I think they've, they've shown that over the years. I mean, they came out of the gates, you know, blistering after, you know, last year, right. This, um, is, this is the best start to a season Brad Underwood's had. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about how bad Thanksgiving was last year with that, with the loss to, to Cincinnati. And I know they, they ended up beating Kansas state. Right. And you know, but even, even that was like, eh, it was Kansas state. So 2021 great season. You started five and three. You yeah. lost to, to Rutgers, Missouri, and Baylor. Yeah, and you could and you could argue that this was a harder schedule. <laughs> you could make that argument. I mean, like maybe it's maybe it's apples to apples, but you could you could certainly make that argument. But yeah, this is look. I, I remember my freshman year. I always talk about like I was the only freshman on the team, so like I was just kind of like a deer in the headlights. Like, uh, tell me when stuff is, I'll be there, and I just trying to hitch rides from guys and. I remember I was walking, we were playing, it was a bragging rights game. So we were about to go to the practice facility. <laughs> this is crazy. We're about to go to the practice facility and I don't have a ride. Like for, for whatever reason, like I just didn't have a ride there and I wanted to get there early. And uh, it was, was like a snowstorm. And if you remember in 2012, it was like the end of the Mayan calendar. <laughs> like it was like the world was supposed to end and I'm walking, I'm pulling luggage from the six pack to oven and this like blizzard starts and I'm like walking in this blizzard. There's no one on campus. I feel like I'm like the only person on earth. And I'm like, is this really happening? Like, is this, is this really happening? And then our bus breaks down on the way to the bragging rights game. And, and gross had like this. Now nah, I'm like, you know, tangent, but like oh, yeah. gross had this whole like thing. We're like, we're road warriors. We're, we go on the road. We're road warriors. Our bus breaks down on the way to the bragging rights game. And this like, kind of triple a type company comes to get us what were they called the road warriors <laughs> and then and then we go down there and, and we end up uh had getting our first loss of the season we were 12 and 0 phil pressy had like whatever you know it was one for three yeah. for 19 and had 16 assists or something crazy but uh yeah wanted to mention that story because always <laughs> winter break always tends to remind me of that gross was gross was loving that too yeah he was like, Got the road well, he, had, he, he had his ladders. Yeah, he, he had his sayings, man. He had his wristbands, all those. He things. was the, that man was the king of acronyms. He, he was it. the king of acronyms, man. No question. Michael Tupper, the goods, man. Appreciate the time. All right, man.